Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Isra Pananon Weeks, Interim Executive Director and Chief of Staff at the National Asian Pacific American Women's Forum. On behalf of NAPOF and Asian Americans Advancing Justice, otherwise known as AAJC, welcome to our community briefing, The Fall of Roe, The Fight for Reproductive Justice for Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. As we all are witnessing, abortion is under siege. Across the country, states are restricting abortion from Texas banning abortion at six weeks to Arizona and Florida passing 15 week abortion bans. The greatest of these assaults occurred last week when the Supreme Court overturned decades of legal precedents and the constitutional right to abortion access established by Roe v. Wade. This is a direct assault on communities of color, including Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. 35% of pregnancies within the API community end in abortion, making it a critical part of reproductive health care for millions. Yet the path to getting an abortion for many in the API community is often riddled with language barriers, deep cultural stigmas, and low rates of, low rates of insurance coverage. This is especially true for API Americans who have continued to show up for the work each day throughout the pandemic, working for low wage, frontline service jobs. For so many, it is difficult, if not impossible, to get time off from work or get money to travel for an abortion. Now, more than ever, people will be forced to travel hundreds and thousands of miles outside of their home state to access abortion care or be forced to carry pregnancies against their own personal will and choice. We are gathering here today to talk through the impacts on, of this decision on Asian American Pacific Islanders and where we go from here. We have an amazing lineup line of speakers today, each offering their unique perspectives about the Supreme Court decision. If you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A window. And for those of you streaming live on Facebook, you can add in your questions into the comments as well. We will also save time at the end for additional questions. Our first speaker is Nia T. Shaw, Director of Litigation at AAJC. NAPOF was proud to partner with AAJC last fall in an amicus brief in the Dobbs case representing 29 community and civil rights AAPI organizations focusing solely on the experience of AAPI women in the United States. Prior to joining AAJC, Nia T worked as an election counsel for Project Vote, investigating, litigating, and advocating against violations of federal and constitutional statutory law nationwide. She's also worked as a family, consumer, and housing law attorney. Welcome, Nia T. Thank you, Isra, and let me please get started with um, just a short background of what this case kind of started at, the case name Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization um, was filed after Mississippi filed a state law banning abortion after 15 weeks of pregnancy. You should know that the state enacted this ban in direct defiance of Roe and the nearly 50 years of Supreme Court precedent affirming Rose Court holding that every pregnant person has the right to decide whether or not to continue their pregnancy prior to viability. Uh, we should note that in following this precedent, that ban was struck down by both the federal trial court as well as the federal appeals court. It was then appealed to the Supreme Court with the express purpose of overturning Roe. Um, as we all know now, that did come to fruition, and I'd like to talk a little bit more about what the opinion said and did. The majority opinion was by Justice Alito, and he was joined by Justices Thomas, Barrett, Kavanaugh, and Gorsuch. Uh, Chief Justice Roberts filed a separate concurrence and joined in the judgment. Um, that meant that he agreed with the outcome of upholding Mississippi's law banning abortions after 15 weeks of pregnancy, but did not ag agree with overturning Roe. Um, the opinion, majority opinion holds that the Constitution does not confer a right to abortion and that Roe and Casey are officially overruled. The opinion holds that so long as a state has what it calls a legitimate interest or a rational basis in enacting a law that prohibits abortions, then uh, this reason or legitimate uh, interest can be as simple as preservation of prenatal life at all stages of development, and that's a direct quote, then such a law will be upheld by courts. This means that a state can provide no exceptions to a ban on abortion, including but limited 
to exceptions uh, against abortion for women's health or age, or whether it was an instance of rape or incest. Uh, to go into a little bit more detail about Justice Polito's opinion here, it begins by setting forth a very skewed historical context to explain that, the, uh, that abortion was not really contemplated by the framers of her constitution and was not the law in any state uh, for a very long time and definitely prior to Roe. He also references British common law and scholars such as uh, uh, Sir Matthew Hale, who were the uh, you know, eminent scholars of common law, but it's important to notice, uh, note that these scholars like Sir Matthew Hale sentenced two women to be executed for witchcraft and believed that marital rape was not a crime. Um, tellingly, Justice Alito fails to acknowledge that the US Constitution was drafted uh, before it afforded women, the, no, sorry. He, you know, as the dissent points out, he fails to acknowledge that the United States Constitution as drafted affording women no rights. He also fails to acknowledge that women couldn't vote until the 19th Amendment was ratified in 1920. Although he says, and I quote, until the latter part of the 20th century, there was no support in American law for a constitutional right to obtain abortion. No state constitutional provision had recognized such a right. It is not a coincidence that as women gained a voice and the right to vote, that abortion laws began to change. And of course, nowhere in his historical recitation does Justice Alito mention the long and brutal history of unsafe abortions. Um, Justice Alito's opinion attempts to distinguish Roe and Casey from other cases in which a constitutional right is not explicitly in the United States Constitution, such as Griswold and Eisenstadt, which dealt with the right to contraception, Lawrence, which uh, allowed sexual same-sex um, gay sex, and Obergefell, which allowed same-sex marriage, by claiming that the rights at issue in those cases do not destroy, quote, a potential life without really discussing the life and health of a woman who's forced to carry a pregnancy she does not want, nor the incredible high rates of mortality in the United States. So basically, on the one hand, the uh, opinion basically says that the uh, that this opinion, uh, I quote, uh, should uh, you know that it doesn't apply to these cases that I just listed. But on the other hand, and I quote, and this is from the majority opinion, the underlying theory on which this argument rests that the Fourteenth Amendment's due process clause provides substantive as well as procedural protection for quote liberty has long been controversial. This is from the majority opinion. Um, so even though he says that these other rights are, where we say nothing about them, and that there is no shadow by this opinion on to these other rights that we've just talked about. This was the other quote that he has, and this our uh, opinion seems to contradict itself and certainly cast a huge shadow on the 14th Amendment jurisprudence that is arguably the underpinning of many of the rights that we hold close, including, as I've mentioned, contraception, same-sex marriage, and gay sex, as well as interracial marriage. Um, and at least one justice, Justice Thomas, in his concurrence, basically went and said that explicitly that these cases were uh, these cases as in Griswold, Lawrence, and Obergefell were wrongly decided and that they were demonstrably erroneous and the court should overrule that. Uh, so this, this is generally the opinion, of course, the dissent uh, kind of goes into why this uh, reasoning was flawed and, uh, you know, basically rejects the reasoning, but that is the main part of this opinion and I'll turn it back to Easter. Thank you so much, Nancy, for both the legal analysis and just the historical context. So now more than ever, it's so important for us to continue speaking out and telling our own stories. Our next speaker is here just to do that. Gina Nam is a NAPOF member representing our Texas chapter and an abortion storyteller with We Testify, an organization dedicated to the leadership and representation of people who have abortions. Welcome, Gina. Thanks so much for that introduction, Isra. Um, I'd like to add that I'm also a proud board member of the Religious Coalition for Reproductive Rights. And I'm a staff member at Houston Women's Reproductive Services, which is a clinic that provides medication abortions to Texans. And that's actually where I'm joining you from right now. 
We've recently been granted a temporary restraining order by a district judge to resume services, which the state has already declared that it's going to appeal. So we're trying to help as many Texans as possible before that happens. Um, so I do apologize that I'll have to leave this briefing in a few minutes as we are a bit overwhelmed and short staffed here. And um, I just so appreciate um, this space and for everyone who's joining us today. Um, as someone who has had an abortion, loves people who have had abortions, works with people seeking abortion care, I was devastated doesn't even begin to describe it um, by Friday's decision because I know what it feels like to be pregnant when you don't want to be. I know the fear. I know the desperation and the sense of urgency. Um, when I was 20 years old, I found out I was pregnant at seven weeks. I had irregular periods and wouldn't have suspected I was pregnant if it weren't for my morning sickness. Um, I was on medical leave from school due to struggles with my mental health and I could barely take care of myself, much less make it through a pregnancy and raise a child. There was no question in my mind that I wanted an abortion. And looking back, it was one of the most powerful decisions that I've ever made. I could get into all of the details of why my abortion was necessary, but the message that I want everyone here to take home is that, that at the end of the day, it shouldn't matter. We shouldn't have to justify decisions that are ours to make to people in power who are hellbent on taking them away from us. We are the experts of our own lives, right? We know what's best for us, for our families and our futures. Um, my story is only one of many and AAPI people have abortions for a whole range of reasons. But one thing that we all have in common is that our abortions were essential, full stop. Um, it may seem hard to believe I was not always this outspoken about my abortion. Um, and I was afraid to talk about it, even as I was well into my advocacy journey in working with abortion funds and clinics. Um, and I think that demonstrates how powerful stigma can be. It has played a huge role in how we got to this moment because the opposition hasn't been afraid to use the word abortion. Um, stigma has allowed anti-abortion extremists to define what abortion is and isn't and use their lies and medical inaccuracies to shape policy that affects all of us today. So how do we fight stigma? We fight stigma by sharing our abortion stories if we have them. Um, and also we fight stigma by being radically, unapologetically and publicly pro-abortion because abortion is a moral good both for the individuals who have them and for their communities. Um, stigma had me thinking that I was alone in my abortion experience as a Korean American woman when things couldn't have been farther from the truth, right? As Isra mentioned, about a third of AAPI pregnancies end in abortion. So our people need access to this care, especially those who are uninsured, undocumented, are already parenting, and are recent immigrants just struggling to make ends meet. We see these patients here at this clinic, and it is cruel and unconscionable to make them jump through these impossible hoops to get the time sensitive and urgent care that they need. So we need to call these bans and restrictions out for what they are, which are racist, classist, misogynist, ableist attacks on our communities. I also thought that I was alone in uh, being a person of faith who had an abortion, um, despite the fact that the majority of people who have abortions identify as religious, most of them Christian, Anti-abortion religious rhetoric continues to stigmatize the many AAPI people of faith who have had and will have abortions. It shuts down conversations that might help them, um, that could have helped me feel less isolated in their abortion experiences. I'm a child of Korean immigrants who grew up in a small, conservative, white evangelical town, and the abortion stigma I had internalized from both my ethnic and religious communities was by far the most difficult part of my abortion experience. And now not only is my faith consistent with my beliefs about abortion and reproductive justice, it also drives my activism because I want to ensure that no one is shamed or punished for making decisions based on their own conscience and knowing what's best for them. So now is the time for us to show up for the people in our communities who need this care or who will need this care in the future. Um, like we say, we testify, everyone loves someone who's had an abortion. And these restrictions and bans are designed to isolate the person seeking care 
not only through stigma, but also by creating a climate of fear and confusion that makes it difficult for pregnant people to know who they can trust, right? Um, we have the opportunity to draw on the strength and depth of our community ties, our relationships with each other to fight that stigma and isolation. Um, the civil rights activist and Asian American feminist Grace Lee Boggs said it best, the only way to survive is by taking care of one another. We need to be smart and keep each other safe in doing so. So I encourage everyone on this call to follow and support the work of the Digital Defense Fund, the Repro Legal Defense Fund, and learn how to help pregnant people safely um, and protect ourselves and our folks from being criminalized and prosecuted for their pregnancy outcomes, which has been happening since even before Friday's ruling, since before SB8. Um, it sounds like a paradox, you know, being both open about our support for API people who need abortions while also being discreet and strategic about how we do so, but that's what this moment calls for. And I think that AAPI communities are in a unique position to do that. I want to lift up the work of grassroots abortion funds who have been preparing for this moment and have the wisdom, the connections and the infrastructure to help people safely navigate a post-row landscape. And so I encourage everyone to learn about their local abortion funds and support their work. I'll close by saying that Roe was the floor the bare minimum, right? And it was ripped out from under us. And in the midst of this devastation, we as a community have the opportunity to build power for long-term change, okay? We're done settling for crumbs, the patchwork landscape of access to care. We can build a world in which everyone can get the abortions they need with ease, um, at home with pills or at a clinic down the street from where they live, surrounded by the care and support of their loved ones, the community free from fear of being criminalized, free of stigma, free of having to jump through hoops. Um, that's the vision and it will take all of us to make it a reality. Thank you so much for listening to my story and I'll pass it back to you, Isra. Thank you so much, Gina. And I see you're getting some love in the chat that, that was so powerful. Um, I wanna echo that. I also wanna um, tell you how courageous you are um, and really appreciate your advocacy, advocacy and care right now. Um, I want to lift up two things you said, that um, we are the experts in our own lives and that everyone loves someone who has had an abortion. I hope that everyone remembers those words. So at this time, it's my pleasure to welcome our next speaker, Representative Anna Eskamani. Representative Eskamani is a state legislator in the Florida House of Representatives. Alongside being a champion for abortion rights, Representative Eskamani made history as the first Iranian American elected to any public office in the state of Florida. Thank you for being here, Representative Eskamani. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you so much to our incredible storytellers for being so brave and sharing their personal experiences and for affirming others who made the decision to end a pregnancy as we're in this pivotal and and devastating moment in the history of gender equity and will not stop fighting. And so I wanna say thank you uh, to Napa for having me here today. Again, my name my name is Anna V. Eskamani. I'm proud daughter of working class immigrants who were born and raised in Iran and met each other in Orlando. I have a twin sister in Ida and a big brother named Aria. And we did everything we could to achieve the American dream growing up in this country. And everything in my life took a shift. My mom was diagnosed with cancer and passed away when I was 13 years old. So as I was growing up as a young woman navigating not only my identity and being one of the only Iranians in a classroom setting, um, trying to fit in, trying to find myself, uh, we were struck with this tragedy of losing my mom, not having someone to talk to about dating, about relationships, about prevention. And my public school at the time also had absence only education, which is not really education. It was filled of disinformation efforts to basically shame young people who make a decision to engage in sexual activity. And they're doing so without any information to stay safe, to prevent pregnancy, and of course, prevent STIs. That I find myself at the tender age of 16 looking for answers by myself. And I turned to a Planned Parenthood Health Center. And Planned Parenthood was there for me when I made an appointment to access contraception for the first time. 
and was able to start on a method of birth control that was right for me, leading me to become very involved in uh, reproductive rights as a college student and eventually working at Planned Parenthood of Southwest and Central Florida, where I served as a senior director of public affairs and communications in the front lines fighting for abortion rights. And so when I ran for office as a first time candidate back in 2018, I was one of the few Planned Parenthood staffers making that jump to really put a line in the sand to say, we're gonna stand unapologetically for abortion rights. And we're gonna be proactive, not reactive in the face of extremism, stripping us away of our rights. And so as I now serve in the legislature as an abortion out loud advocate and as a proud Asian American woman, we are now faced with a crisis and the fights are now in the states. We no longer have a federal firewall. And as the previous speaker already stated, Roe never even granted every person access to an abortion. Roe was the floor, not the ceiling. And indeed, dependent on your demographics, your income levels, whether you are documented or undocumented, if you live with a disability, some of these other variables impacted your ability to access a full range of reproductive care services, including abortion. And now as we face this pivotal moment in American history, I have to remind myself and others that there is no easy fix to restoring reproductive freedom in this country. It was a 50 year insidious and intentional effort by anti-abortion extremists to strip us away of our rights. And that is not gonna be corrected or addressed within a day, within a week. It won't be solved through executive orders. It won't even be solved through one election cycle. This is going to take all of us coming together to break abortion stigma, to share our stories, to elect the right people into office, we're not gonna be scared to talk about this issue and to hold those accountable who wish to ban abortion. And that brings me to Florida where we are uniquely positioned in the Southeast because of a strong right to privacy in our state constitution, which has served as a barrier from other past anti-abortion laws from being enforced and implemented. And right now we are in court over House Bill 5, which is a 15 week abortion ban signed by Governor Ron DeSantis this year that has no exceptions for rape, incest, or human trafficking. And we are hoping for injunctive relief so we can pause the enforcement of this bill. But if we are not successful, Florida will have a 15-week ban starting this Friday. And there are abortion providers in our state who are working overtime to serve as many patients as they can who need access to an abortion after 15 weeks. And so as providers are working long hours, as advocates are, are uh, hitting the streets and sharing their stories, we're also thinking long-term how to build political power to help ensure that everyday people understand the importance of voting at this moment and to hold all of our elected officials accountable because we have receipts and we have asks. Not only do we know what elected officials voted for the abortion ban and voted against exceptions for rape and incest, human trafficking, but we also know that every elected official plays a role in responding to this crisis. And whether it's the White House and pursuing all legal options and executive orders to protect what we have for abortion access, including abortion by pill being available regardless of state restrictions, people should be able to safely travel regardless of state policies trying to do otherwise. But we also look towards our prosecutors to not charge those who self-manage their abortion. We look towards state officials like myself to hold the line, to push back against abortion bans, to hold their colleagues accountable for their past actions that have brought us to this place. And we look towards our municipal leaders to ensure that they are prioritizing abortion funds, that they are supporting security needs at local health centers as anti-abortion terrorism is on the rise, and our school board members to see if they can put into place comprehensive sexual education programs alongside ensuring that if a student needs to access an abortion, they have a, a, a way to learn about that option and are, are supported in every way possible. And so we really are at a pivotal moment right now in our global history and our nation's history when it comes to the direction America is going, reproductive freedom. I think it's important to say that 
countries around the world have been liberalizing their abortion rights as Florida and the United States are moving backwards. And these fights have a profound impact on people of color. And that's a really important step, a point I wanna stress before I wrap up. Abortion bans impact every type of person. You know, if you have the ability to become pregnant, you may need an abortion. And a ban absolutely sets barriers in your way. But if you are someone of means, if you have resources, then you will find a way to travel safely, take time off work, to express bodily autonomy in a dignified manner and, and come back home. It's gonna be inconvenient and it's clearly unnecessary, but those of means will find a way. It is those who do not have means, our low wealth folks, our people of color, our people with disabilities, folks who are undocumented, folks who do not speak English as a first language, folks who don't have a supportive family network. It is our communities who have not only the most to lose in this moment, but will be locked in poverty, will be, un, un, will be, will be punished simply for being poor. And that alone should be an outrage for people across this country. And there is no way to fully enforce an abortion ban unless you prosecute and potentially incarcerate people who end their own pregnancy. And we all know that the judicial system is one with deep racial disparities. So the first people who will be prosecuted for ending their own pregnancy will be the people that I just described. Will be people who look like me. It'll be all of our BIPOC community members who are most at risk of facing prosecution, as we saw already in Texas, where a woman was arrested for ending her own pregnancy. Fortunately, the prosecutor did not pursue charges but that alone is not only traumatizing, but it is a warning sign for every American that none of our freedoms are guaranteed under this Supreme Court, under this Congress, and of course, under different political landscapes like in Florida. And with that said, we have to fight for one another because these issues are intrinsically tied to LGBTQ plus equality, intrinsically tied to access to contraception, and so if we leave anyone behind, we are repeating mistakes of past social movements. And so we must be intentional and intersectional in our work and be committed to this fight long-term. And so for that, I thank you so much for the opportunity to share space and I look forward to any questions that folks have. Thank you so much, Representative Eskamani, uh, for your fire, your energy and taking this crisis um, head on. Something you. Um, just said really spoke to me that, you know, reproductive justice isn't a single issue, right? It involves the immigration system, the judicial system, all these systems that are um, built to protect us that aren't in this moment. So thank you for uh, mentioning that. So our next speaker is Nadia Hussein. Nadia is the senior campaign director for Moms Rising, an organization taking on the most critical issues facing women, mothers, and families by educating the public and mobilizing massive grassroots action. She's also the co-founder of the Bangladeshi American Women's Development Initiative, a community initiative empowering Bangladeshi women and girls in New Jersey. Welcome, Nadia. Thank you so much. So um, today, you know, one of the things I wanted to bring up is, you know, a little bit about Moms Rising. You know, Moms Rising was established in 2006 as a multi-issue national movement to mobilize and advocate not only for moms, not only for moms, but with and alongside moms to ensure economic prosperity for our family. So as I talk about economic prosperity, the fact that the right to have bodily autonomy and make the most rudimentary decisions about reproductive health um, and and how many children we want, whether or not we want children, impacts everything. You cannot have any kind of economic stability, economic decision-making, economic choice without having the most fundamental baseline uh, control over your own body and what goes on with your body and what you do with your body. And as, as Moms Rising works on so many issues, the right to abortion, the right to reproductive justice, the right to reproductive health choice is, is the base of everything. We, as, um, as a previous speaker mentioned, it's, it's not just multi-issue. All the issues are based on this, on this individual decision-making ability. 
being able to choose if, when, and how many children to have, which includes the right to um, abortion care, it's a fundamental right. And as Moms Rising, we advocate, I personally, I work on, I'm a senior campaign director working on early learning and childcare access, but we have teams that work on paid leave, equal pay, child care, uh, ch my child care team, uh, maternal justice and immigration. And again, all of these, all of these pieces are uh, intimately and intricately related to abortion care. We, the majority of people who are, who are um, seeking abortions, who get abortion care are already moms. Actually six in 10 women who have abortions um, are moms already and half of them have two or more children. So there's so many counter narratives and harmful narratives and misogynistic white supremacist narratives about who gets abortions and why they get it. But the bottom line is it should be, a, it should be the choice of the person giving birth. Uh, we, Many of the extremist far-right politicians that have made these decisions um, on behalf of women, but not on behalf against women, against people who give birth, you know, they they are they are the same ones who won't expand paid leave. They uh, shut down childcare access, shut down equal pay. So the, the these children, if they're if they're born or being forced to be born, then the the mother the caregiver doesn't have access to that paid leave to take care of them. We don't even have paid maternity leave in the majority of this country. Um, in New Jersey is one of the few states that does it, where I think one of seven states, it's a, it's a, it, the majority of states don't even have paid maternity leave whatsoever or paid leave whatsoever. We have no federal paid leave. Um, as I work on childcare right now, we're working on uh, what's happening in Congress and it's there's so much pushback to even get childcare. And so we're, we, we have these children, but no child care, um, none of these benefits. And all that does is further harm our uh, mothers and families' ability to take care of their, to thrive, take care of their families. They, there's a statistic that half of women who've um, had an abortion, and I think in 2014, that's the last time I could find the statistics, were below the poverty line. And that women who are denied an abortion are were four times more likely to be living in poverty years later. This is like this is an economic issue. It is it is um, it is in it's in its core really that that is what it is. On top of being a healthcare issue and so many other things that are tied in. And on top of that, the states with maternal death, um, the worst maternal death rates in this country, maternal mor mor mortality and morbidity, meaning morbidity, meaning injury from birth. Um, you know, the United States has the worst maternal death rate of any developed nation already. And the states that have had the worst outcomes for maternal death also have, are, also have already had the worst abortion restrictions. So again, this decision is going to kill people who give birth. It's going to uh, it's just it's just going to increase that rate um, and increase that harm. And honestly, if the goal of those passing abortion restrictions was to actually avoid abortion and support moms and have healthy births, they'd be passing laws for pre free birth control instead of rolling them back, uh, pro providing all of these things that I just mentioned. But that's not what's happening. It is an absolute attack on anybody who has the ability to give birth. Um, and I wanted to just transition a little bit to uh, the, the community I work with every, every day, the community I come from, the Bangladeshi community and the greater South Asian American community. As was mentioned before by many speakers, you know, this is a white supremacist, racist, um, you know, and misogynistic movement. Right, that is taking that took that overturned Roe v. Wade, and all of that disproportionately falls on the on the backs of Black women and women of color. And I will say for our community, which has, you know, our Bangladeshi American community is disproportionately immigrant. There are language barriers, there are cultural barriers, there are systemic barriers. And all of that only gets exacerbated as you take away these the, the ability to make choices for ourselves and our families. There, there was, even before Roe v. Wade, I was overturned. The, the case of Purvi Patel, which I know Napoff worked, worked on and really advocated on, you know, our community is vulnerable to being uh, more heavily persecuted for stillbirths, for miscarriages. And, part, and so much of this is about taking away, intentionally taking away our voices and our choices. My Bangladeshi community, another thing I really wanted to mention is it's also 
imposing a religious ideology on so many of our communities. This religious ideology, uh, which overturned Roe v. Wade, because that is what it is. It is a Christian hegemonic um, uh, colonial mindset and a, a, a goal. And it's, it, it, uh, religions like Islam, Hinduism, they don't stay on the, they don't have the exact same belief system. So to impose a religious ideology on a Muslim American community that has a more nuanced view and more grave view on abortion also goes against our fundamental religious rights and freedoms. And so, on so I, as I, sit here, I'm in New Jersey, we, we do have strong laws, but they're not codified. If we have a new governor that comes into office, they can just turn um, turn everything back around. They can easily ban abortion in our states. And I will have domestic violence survivors, interpersonal violence survivors in our community who will be stuck not being able to make decisions for themselves. Um, mental illness will only get worse. Uh, um, issues with, um, in, you know, again, like some of these domestic violence issues will only get worse. Another thing I want to mention is many people, many of the women, especially in our community, are in multi-generational households. We're taking care of our elderly. We're taking care of our children. And to impose a birth, a forced birth on a, on, on a woman when she's already taking care of so much and is not given the right to make that decision is only going to perpetuate any inequities, any difficulties, any mental health circumstances, any issues of, of that lead to vulnerability and abuse. So. Um, I'm definitely very concerned um, for my community. And I will say that we, um, I hope we'll talk more, but this is not the end. This is the beginning because we will get this right back. Okay. Um, and we will win. It might not feel that way, but that's what's going to happen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nadia, and especially for that last sentence of, of hope because we really need it right now. Um, and thank you for also mentioning that we should have the fundamental right of individual decision-making ability and to make choices for ourselves and our families. So last but not least, our final speaker is Sari Lee. Sari is the National Campaign and Membership Director at NAPOF. In 2022, they became the recipient of the Chicago Foundation for Women's Vanguard Award, which honors young leaders for their work improving the lives of women and girls. Welcome, Sari. Hi all, it's so good to be in community with all of you. I wanna thank Navoff and then also just all our speakers um, for being in this space. And I'm really excited to talk to y'all about what's next. Um, and so I'm someone as an organizer who strongly believes in using every single tool in our toolbox and never just relying on one tactic. We're talking about legal tactics, legislative tactics, organizing tactics, direct action tactics, using every single tool in our toolbox. And so we recently published an op-ed in Mochi Magazine, um, which we're more than happy to share um, in the chat, but then also after this briefing, where we really outline why it is that the next steps for continuing the fight to expand abortion access need to continue at the ballot box and also beyond the ballot box as well. And so where states where abortion access has effectively ended or will effectively end following the Dobbs decision, those states are voter suppression states. And those are states where also the AECA community has exponentially increased. So in states like Texas, where one third of the pop or one fifth of the population, um, you know, is um, API, it's really important or it's really important that we continue to um, fight for both voting rights, as well as abortion rights, as well as every single right that we have. Um, the fight for abortion access is interconnected with the fight for voting rights, LGBTQIA plus rights, all of our rights. And this, as many of the folks on speaking on this, on this panel today have already said, this is a long-term fight. It's going to take the next several months, next several years for us to be able to eventually win and many people are only tuning into this fight right now. And that is totally okay. Um, these ongoing threats to our rights present opportunities for us to meet our people in the moment and bring them into the movement. Um, but at the same time, I also want to caveat that, you know, oftentimes voting can fall short as a strategy, especially if it's used as the only strategy. 
that's why it's so important that moving forward and even before this moment that we need to do the most important work, which is to hold open conversations with people in our communities about abortion. These conversations need to happen both online and in real life, person to person. And again, this is a long-term strategy. It's not going to turn back the SCOTUS decision, um, but what it will help us do is to build power for reproductive justice in our long, in our lifelong fights. Um, and while many of the people across the country are forming their opinions based on politicians' fear mongering, biased news, and misinformation, and particularly if we're thinking about in our own communities, the WhatsApp group chats and WeChat um, and the Facebook groups out there, we need to be the ones to help them think critically about their values and why each person should really, at the end of the day, be able to make the decisions best for themselves and their families and their communities. Um, and the more that we engage community members on the issue, the more that we will destigmatize abortion. Because at the end of the day, um, NAPA's polling after the 2020 election showed that 85% of API women voters support abortion access. I think there are a lot of, you know, partner organizations who've joined the briefing today. And oftentimes, you know, what comes up as a concern is, you know, engaging on a politicized issue such as abortion as a 501c3 organization. And in a nutshell, 501c3 nonpartisan uh, nonprofits can absolutely talk about abortion, can make a public stance on abortion, and can engage their clients, their volunteers, and their community members in abortion advocacy, especially without reference to a specific specific piece of legislation and call to action. And so when voting is made accessible to APIs, we can determine the outcomes of the election. So we are the margins of victory. Um, for example, as low as 1,000 votes in Pinellas County, which has a 20,000 API citizen voting age population as of 2020, um, in a county like Pinellas County, where we are focusing on door knocking efforts in Florida this year, we can determine, again, the outcomes of the election. And so that's why the work that we must do now, you know, and even before this moment, and in this moment, and continue moving forward, is integrated voter engagement. Um, by making states responsible for abortion rights and access, what the Supreme Court has done is that it's ensured that the battle for reproductive care um, continues to rest partly on our state representatives and policies. Um, and as you know, um, Representative Escamani has already articulated, this fight has started on the local level and has permeated across all levels of government. And so that's why it's important that we need our community members to understand how to vote down the ballot and why it's critical that they, they must do so. Um, not just you know, when we have presidential elections, but every election cycle, particularly this year with the midterm election. And so this year, NOPOF has been running voter mobilization campaigns in Georgia, Florida, and Texas to turn out API women voters in the midterm election. So in phase one of our canvassing, what we will be doing is we'll be asking voters if they plan to vote, what issues they care about, and how they feel about abortion. In phase two of our canvassing, we will contact the same voters again to get them ready to vote and talk about any questions or concerns that they have. And while we do this, we'll connect why they should vote to the issues that they care about. In particular, explain what the abortion landscape looks like in their state. And then in phase three, we will contact the voters one last time to get their commitments and confirm that they will be voting. So through these three phases of, of um, canvassing, what we'll be doing is we'll be making um, and, you know, making tens of thousands of attempts at the doors and on the phones to API women voters um, through our multilingual year-round deep canvassing program, which is not just, again, focused on voting, it's also integrated with you know, talking about the issue of abortion. So already in Florida, we had in a survey to you know, just understand what you know, community members, what API women voters, feel about abortion, to understand their abortion attitudes. Um, and so in May, our Florida chapter phone bank API women voters in the Tampa Bay area to understand our community's views on abortion. Of the 93 people we talked to during just that one month, 
55 people believe that abortion should be made legally available for all who want it. Um, 30 people believe abortion should not be restricted up to a certain point during pregnancy. And then 32 people are planning to vote in the upcoming election. Um, in Texas, we've created in language an in-language abortion access guide um, in six different Asian languages. So that includes Korean, Vietnamese, Telugu, Tamil, Tagalog, and then Chinese. Um, and so with both our abortion attitude survey, as well as the dissemination of a translated abortion access guide, these are ways that we are engaging our community members on the issue of abortion that's integrated with their voter program. Um, and so at every stage that we contact voters, we are asking them to get involved with the organization, whether by meeting one-on-one -on -one with a member, joining our outreach efforts, or attending an upcoming event or meeting. And while our goal, of course, is to turn out AAPI women voters to the polls, we ultimately want to identify you know, who can speak about our issues with community members and move others to action. And that's how we run integrated voter engagement programs that we can incorporate abortion messaging into our scripts. We believe that the election is an opportunity for us to build relationships with our community that can last beyond just this one election season, um, but for every election season and long term for us to build up our power. And so I have a few action items for you all. The first is to join us. We need in-person door knockers in Texas and Florida, as well as virtual phone bankers in Texas, Florida, and Georgia. Um, Please use Knopf's resources to start and continue conversations about abortion in our community, which you can do using our How to Talk About Abortion guide at knopoff.org slash talkaboutabortion. In addition to that, we also want y'all to register folks to vote and help our community members to get to the polls and after the election, continue to engage those same community members year round to organize. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sari, for sharing your thoughts through your lens as an organizer. Um, and of course, I'm biased, but as an absolute powerhouse NAPOF uh, employees, we're proud of you. Um, so at this time, we're going to um, take a few questions. I see a few questions in the chat. Um, this first one um, is really um, about the men. So question is, how can we get more men to be better and proactive allies in this movement? This is a men's issue too. How do we hold men more accountable to fighting control over women's bodies? Um, I can try at that one. I mean, I, 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 I've seen a lot of um, multi-gender solidarity for sure. Um, and so I, I think, it, I think it's, it varies per person. I mean, step one is talk to your family, right? Like, the, 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 the men in your life to, you know, have a conversation with them. It might not be something in their radar and they might not have had a chance to really talk about it because maybe they feel uncomfortable talking about it or they don't know how to approach the conversation. So I do think it is our personal networks. And obviously talking as an Iranian American, um, we don't really talk about these subjects in our spaces. I mean, dating is like a taboo subject in my family. Um, let alone personal decisions about a pregnancy. So I do think in, in like all my cultural spaces, I'll speak to my experience, like just even talking about pregnancy and, and relationships and dating can be like kind of, uh, you know, um, not familiar territory for some of our families. So we need to have that conversation and have that conversation with your brothers, with your sons, with your cousins, with your with your elders, with your friends, you know, bring it up in these spaces. It doesn't always have to be at a political rally. It can be um, while you're having dinner, right? And just some of these organic family spaces and, and breach the conversation. Um, and then from there, it's the call to action. So, you know, what, what would be the most helpful role for uh, uh, allies to play? And that can look different for every community. Speaking for me, you know, I, I coming out to our events, um, helping to register people to vote, helping your peers, your your male peers understand the value. And sometimes that peer to peer conversation is much more impactful. So, you know, if you have a a, a, a crew you hang out with and play video games, like bring this up, right, and talk about it, and ask them to be that liaison. Um, into their spaces and to maintain the energy from now 
not just into November, but after, because as we all already stress, these issues and this fight does not end with an election. Like collective liberation uh, is not determined by one election cycle. It's gonna be a very long fight to get our rights back and to go beyond Roe. And so we need that engagement to be um, uh, throughout that person's life. And so to ask them to make that commitment and to hold them accountable too. Move on to the, the next question. Great, so our next question is, what can be done to strengthen states such as Colorado, Illinois, or even Kansas, um, I guess with the ability to absorb the increased uh, volume of patients um, from the, the states that um, are currently not allowing abortion? So I can help answer this question. So many of the states that are, you know, called abortion haven states, um, those states also, there's a lot of work to be done. Um, so we're talking about states like Colorado, Illinois, California, Minnesota, New York. Um, there's still a lot of work to be done in those states. And so, for example, in Minnesota, where we also have a map off chapter, um, the Be Pro Coalition on Restrict Minnesota is really working to expand abortion access. So already abortion is protected. Um, but even then, um, a lot of our partners and community members are really thinking about how do we expand abortion access for Minnesotans in our state who need to access care, but also, you know, for folks who are coming to Minnesota to access care as well. Um, and so what that looks like is making sure that, you know, uh, things like, for example, the uh, Parental Notification of Abortion Act, like that is repealed making sure that you know some of the other abortion restrictions that currently exist in states like Minnesota and even California and New York that those are also um, you know that those are also expanded that you know those restrictions um, are removed and abortion access can be expanded further and so it's really about understanding that even though legally abortion as a right may be protected in those states, there's still a lot to be done in removing the current restrictions that exist in those states, as well as ensuring that, you know, how can we think more creativ creati creatively about expanding abortion access even further. And I wanted to add also that there are you know, there's, there are national abortion funds, right? There's wonderful national organizations who have been providing these funds for years. And now, you know, obviously that luckily some of the, a lot of the donations have gone up. I hope they stay going up. Um, but, but, you know, coordination is just so important just nationally before Roe v. Wade, there was essentially, and I'm not the one coining this term, but um, an underground railroad essentially of, of uh, providing access to abortion care in states. And, and well, it, at that point it was restricted overall, but having that, I mean, I'm in New Jersey here where we really want to, our governor has really prioritized making us a, a beacon for abortion care for those who need it in other states, even far away states. If they're, and so some of these funds um, are actually, there's also funds for travel to cover travel, uh, to cover hotel stays, things like that. So I, um, I I don't have a list right now. I know NAPOF works with many different groups uh, in front of me about where folks can donate. If that's, that is one way to make a difference, but even volunteering for those organizations being part of those organizations, there, I think there really does need to be an amplification uh, and a prioritizing of, of strengthening these relationships in in these in the states mentioned um, in the box because there need there, because the states themselves try to depend on them to get something through legislature. I mean, these are some of these states are a little conservative to be honest. Like Kansas, like there's a bunch of stuff going wrong with Kansas. Okay, um, so I feel like things that are not dependent on a legislature to move, right? I mean, we should do that too, but there should also be at this outside organizing. Frankly, that's what's gonna do it, in my opinion. Thank you. Um, so I see a few more questions in the chat. I wanna, I, I wanna say that we will get to them and we will answer them. We are at time. So I wanna um, just ask a closing question to all of you because, um, you know, as everyone mentioned, like this is a long fight. 
right? And this is a lot of emotional labor to hold. So as a social worker, I believe on checking in um, with our peers who are actively doing this work day to day. So I wanna close by asking you, um, how are you feeling in this moment? Um, give us a word uh, to describe. Um, yeah, how are, you, how are you feeling right now? Well, I'm feeling pissed off. That's two words. Yeah, I would um, echo that and also say determined. So I'm angry and determined to keep fighting. I will say for me, just chaos, but trying to keep myself grounded. <laughs> and that's honestly just where I'm at at the moment. Um, but I believe in hope. And I think it's really, it's really important that we stay grounded in hope. Um, so yeah, all of those things, hyphenated is one word. <laughs> to say yes and motivated, um, motivated and really inspired by everybody who shared their experiences here today. Well, thank you to all of you for sharing that. Um, so on behalf of NAPOF and AAJC, thank you to our speakers and everyone for joining us today. NAPOF Solidarity Statement now has more than 1,200 individual signatures from people in every region of the country and more than 100 organizations. So please visit our website to add your name to the list. And if you've already signed on, please feel free to share the statement and encourage other, others to join us um, in signing and also sharing uh, what we've talked about and learned today. Um, we do plan on sharing the statement and signatures with members of Congress later this week. Um, and also just, you know, stay, stay tuned, keep in contact with the speakers and the organizations today um, as more stuff will be coming out in the next few weeks. Um, thank you. Please take care of yourselves and um, we hope to be in touch soon. Bye everyone. <laughs>